Erminia, it's so great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Very happy to be here. Let's jump right into it. What is the outside principle? So outside is just a fancy word for saying learning by doing. It, I came up with it because so many people think they're going to figure things out by introspection and by thinking about it, and it doesn't work that way. And so I wanted to create a really clear contrast between two different types of learning, the more backwards internally looking and the more experiential learn by doing. Where did you come up with this? I probably can't tell you, <laughs> but I'll tell you this much. The research for that book got sparked by an executive education program that I started when I was on the faculty at INSEAD. And I called it the leadership transition. And it was about helping people, giving people a place to go where they could figure out and get some new skills and some new ideas about how to retool themselves for making a leap up to bigger leadership impact or to a bigger leadership um, role. And that course happened in two weeks. This was way before we had uh, virtual uh, learning. It happened in two different weeks. They came for a week, then they went home, and their homework was to try out some things that they had committed to do, and then they came back a couple months later and talked about it. And it was so immediately clear that these were new people who were arriving <laughs> with a very different perspective in their minds about what they wanted to do and how they were trying to grow as a result of the things they had tried out. Those experiments transformed them. So it's the actual doing. Because I think I've even had people on the show who said it starts from the inside out. You have to be thoughtful and reflective, make a plan, and then execute that plan for whatever it is you want to do. And your arguments, your research, everything you've done says it's actually the opposite? Yeah. Let me explain that. So remember, it, who are the people that we're talking about? We're talking about people who have been extremely successful as subject matter experts, whether functional or technical or analytical or scientific. And so it, it, it's really all about the stuff that they know, and that's how they lead, and that's how they perform. And when it comes to stepping up to a bigger leadership role, they're not so sure they want to do it. They're not so sure they're going to be good at it. It doesn't really make sense to plan because they don't know what it looks like. The best example is delegation. All right. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows you got to delegate. Otherwise, you get nothing done. You can't scale anything. What's the right answer? So there's no point in reflecting or planning. But when it comes down to it, nobody delegates or they don't delegate enough. They micromanage. Why is that? Because they know deep down, based on their past experience, that the work's going to be better if they do it themselves. Now, obviously, that doesn't scale. There's a lot of problems with that. And there's the opportunity cost. But that's why they don't. And you can plan it until you're blue in the face. But until you start trying it and seeing a glimmer of promise, <laughs> you're not going to be motivated to really do it and then to invest in what it takes to do it better. Because a huge part of the learning curve is you start doing these things, you do it in a clumsy way, you're not skilled, you're not good at it, it's not rewarding, and you drop your plan as soon as you get stressed out. So for the person who listens to podcasts during their walk or in a long drive or washing the dishes, and they're thoughtful and reflective, what are ways to put this into action to be more of a doer, to learn more through doing than just the reflective, thoughtful part. Okay, I'm not going to say those things don't help. They do okay. because they help spark thought. All oh, right, this is really what I'm trying to do. But the key is to move from insight to action as quickly as you can. So say you've heard an amazing podcast that has really inspired you, but it's only a podcast. You've been listening for 45 minutes. You probably have a window of opportunity for acting on it. That's a day or two, and then it kind of evaporates. But if you act on it, it won't because you keep learning and building on it. And, and so it's really about taking those windows of opportunity to do something and get started because 
the learning process in these things that I look at, how you lead, how you show up, they're very personal. You're not implementing a cookie cutter way. You've got to tailor it to you by doing it. And so just starting is a really helpful thing. So let's say we get started. We're going where we maybe we listened to a podcast and learned a new way to better run a meeting, for example. And then we implement that for our Monday meeting, which is the day after the podcast. What's next? How do we make sure that we're not just constantly doing all different crazy stuff and not having uh, a set way about us? How do we learn from what we're doing to make sure we can course correct and we're optimally behaving in the way that's going to lead to the objectives we want? So you've noticed, I'm sure, that I use the word experiment a lot when I talk about how we operate. And when you experiment, you're not just randomly doing things and repeating them. You're either going to explore or you're going to have a hypothesis you're testing or a hunch. You're going to do something and then you're going to evaluate it. How did it feel? What feedback did I get? You can be even better in that asking people, I have a buddy that's in that meeting, you say, hey, I'm trying something new. Give me some thoughts afterwards on how it went. what do you think? And so then you can go the next step on this aspect of things. I could have been better in closing that meeting with real clarity on who does what. Next time I'm going to work on the closings because I put so much of my energy on the openings, for example. And that's how you go along. You've got to refine the learning. And and it's I've seen this years and years ago in, in some of my academic research. When you do something, you get two kinds of feedback. One is from your own gut. That felt good. I, I think that was impactful. The other is from other people around you. And that helps you then iterate and take the next step. And in learning, that's always what we're shooting for is iterating so we can take a better next step. What did you learn from Satya Nadella and the job he's done since becoming the CEO of Microsoft in in 2014? Gosh, Mm -hmm. so many things. And it's, it's a little overwhelming because he did so many things right Um, But he also got started a change effort that really had to be picked up and elaborated and implemented by lots of other people. But he, if you think about it, it, there's no magic bullet in what he did. With my students, we end up putting up a huge laundry list of all the things that he did. And what you see is lots and lots of actions the listening tour, the book, the letter, when he gave, I loved it, when he gave his senior team his favorite book, Principles of Nonviolent Communication. New leaders always have to distinguish themselves, differentiate themselves from their predecessors. His predecessor was the opposite, a very kind of in your face, yelling. He looked like he was always having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Satya didn't say, I'm different. He gave a book that said, that's called Principles of Violent, Nonviolent <laughs> Communication. Um, and it wasn't just symbolic and soft and squishy people things. They very quickly made decisions so that people could see that change, things, change was in the air, that things were moving. So for a great example was putting windows on the iPhone. They talked a lot about customer obsession and orientation, but how can you defend that if, in fact, your customers have iPhones and you can't put your product on them because of uh, some old conflict or and com- competitive animosity? So he walked the talk in lots of different ways in terms of business decisions, in terms of how he signaled what he wanted people to do, in terms of walking the talk so many things that were really great exemplars on how to lead change. What about the difference between being, and this I believe came from him, or maybe he learned it from somebody else, but being a know-it-all versus a learn-it-all? Yeah. I thought that was such a great slogan. So, you know, essentially Satya is telling people some equivalent of what got us here won't get us there. We've been hugely successful, but it is no longer a Windows 2.0, 3.0, 6.0, 7.0. We've got to innovate now, and we've been missing that boat. And in order to innovate, we have to be learners. 
We have to be learners. We have to talk to other people. We have to be willing to make mistakes in order to serve our customers. We have to be learners from them rather than just being the experts to say, here's what you need. And so that's what he hammered through the whole time. Yes, we're know-it-alls, we're experts, but it's not enough. We've got to be learn-it-alls as well. Was that know-it-all mentality part of the culture prior to him taking over? Sure, because they were, any company that is so incredibly successful becomes arrogant. And so they had the best and the brightest, and they really did create a product that the entire world uses. Mm -hmm. And so they did know it all. (laughs) <laughs> but at some point that started to run out in terms of the next generation of tools. They they started to lose that. And why was that? Because anytime somebody came up with a new idea, if it didn't run on a Windows interface, it didn't, it didn't get the resources. Yeah. And so they really had to make it be okay again to learn and do new things. And they were also simply just set up to anything other than meeting your targets perfectly flawless execution got you dinged because of the way they assessed performance created competitiveness it meant that people were not collaborating across the silos and so that was also very damaging part of being a learn it all is willing being willing to not know i just love that phrasing that we're going to try to be learn it alls versus the know it alls you you write in your in the updated version of your book about the five universal lessons for stepping up to a bigger impact i'd love to surface each one if you're cool with it and and i'll introduce it and then you could expand is that cool great the first one is you already just mentioned what it which is what got you here won't get you there so I think of, let's make this as practical as possible. For example, and this is this happened in my career, I went from being a individual contributor to then managing the team that I was a part of, I worked in sales, and then being a director of a division and then eventually being a VP where I was leading leaders, right? Your people who are people managers were reporting to me. And each step is a completely different job uh, with different skill sets, and I didn't have any of them as I got promoted. Um, and I think this is like kind of Peter Principle type stuff that happens from time to time, but we're trying hard to avoid that. And most of us won't have the necessary skills before we get there, but we got to do whatever we can to learn them and to be better. So knowing that and, and with the phrase of what got you here won't get you there, how does it apply to that person who keeps moving up the chain and finds out, oh my gosh, I don't fully know what I'm doing in this job because I haven't done it before. What advice do you give to them in the mindset of this? What got you here won't get you there. Okay. I want to tackle that first a little tangentially, and it's that today's organizations are a lot flatter. And so there's less moving up the chain. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so it, it it's not sufficient to wait until you have a new promotion to say, oh, what got me here will get me there. What do I tweak? What I found in my research and with my executives, it's what's often the dangerous period is you're two to three years into a role. You, you're kind of in a, and you're in a groove. You know what you're doing. You can start to do it kind of in your sleep. And guess what? Either your boss expects you to step up and do more, do something different, or something else is happening that's disrupting the organization. And But there isn't a neon sign that's saying, hey, you just got promoted, do something different. And I think today we've got to really watch out for that because those what got you here won't get you there moments happen at lots of different points in time and they can be hard to spot. So do you mean start developing the skills for whatever the ne- the next potential job is years in you know, advance of that? I think that's kind of impossible today with the way jobs and organizations are developing kind of by yeah. leaps and bounds. What I tend to say to people is just get involved in some projects that are at least adjacent to what you do or that involve you in other parts of the organization so you can see more of the bigger picture, so you can see what's going on so that you're able to see how other people operate or to frame what you're doing in terms of the bigger picture. I think those are the things that sort of help because there's more and more jobs that didn't exist a couple years ago. And so the more planful approach 
is tricky. Now, there's still the challenge that you talk about, which is moving up the chain. And that is each time you're managing a team, managing teams of teams or leaders who are leading other, it's, it is a very different job. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, many times, we're just kind of kicked into it and we have to learn it on the go. And that's why who's in your network, who is helping you, who your mentors are, um, it, who, what peers you're talking to is so incredibly valuable because you've got to, you've got to teach yourself. The, that's the third one of the five universal lessons. So let's go there right now. Okay. I think this is huge, Herminia. So I'm glad you wrote this here, your network, the people you surround yourself with you. And what you write about is the fact that you shouldn't just interact with the exact same group all the time. You need fresh quote outside on your job and yourself. I love this. How do you implement this for you? And how do you recommend this for others to really carefully craft the who in their own lives so that they're getting this fresh outside? Okay. So let me just start by saying people don't like to do this at the (laughs) outset. Most people are really terrible about developing their networks. And when you talk to them about crafting that who intentionally, they kind of go, ooh, that's instrumental, that's using people, that's not meritocratic. And so there's a lot of hesitation. It's really based on fear. Am I wasting their time? Will they say no to me? Will they reject me? What do I have to say? But it's also based on a very narrow definition of what my job is. People think their job is to do this thing as opposed to do this thing and to see who's relevant and to get inputs where they come and to think ahead so you can see a little bit around corners. That's what your job is in any at any level because things change fast. And so it takes some... Um, it takes some discussion to get them focused on how important the who is to the what. And obviously, as you're moving up, it becomes more important because as you're moving up in today's world, you're always leading change in one shape or form. <laughs> and so when you're leading change, you've got to get people bought in. You've got to figure out who the key stakeholders are, who's got power, who can block it, who can cooperate. And that's a lot about the who. So your network is such a vital part of everything you're allowed to do. And I'll I'll tell you this amusing thing is for years now, I ask people on a scale of one to four, how important is it to have a good network to be successful? People pick the top grade four. And then, okay, great. On a scale of one to four, how good is your network? From one is needs a lot of improvement to four. Excellent. Most people will give it a two. Okay. Why is that? Because... They don't put the time and energy into figuring out who do I need to be talking to? Who's important to my future? Their networks are a little bit of an accident of their past. Who did I work with and kind of get along with? And they carry that along. And it's only when you really need it, usually when you're out of a job, that you start activating your network. But wouldn't it be much better to have a more constant flow of ideas and perspectives as a result of the people who are part of your every day. What are the first few steps we can take to to create a, a better network, to create a better who, to make it more robust? Yeah. It's really just to start. So, you know, for some people, it you either start with the people or you start with activities. If you start with the people, you say, okay, Who's going to be really relevant to my future? Okay, I'm trying to move in this area. I need some thought leaders or opinion leaders on this. I need some senior people on that. I need some peers on this. Write down some names, reach out, or get somebody to introduce you. Or you say, okay, I just really right now, I just need to get out of the house a little bit more. I need a little bit more breath. What are some activities? Is it a club? Is it a professional association? Is it a a regular Zoom group? What is it, an event, uh, a book club? What is it that actually is just going to dust the cobwebs a little bit and get me interacting with new ideas and people who are outside my immediate? The the famous thing in networks is this idea of the strength of weak ties, Mm -hmm. how 
job leads, creative ideas, everything else come from not the usual suspects, the people you're talking to regularly, but people you don't know so well, or you don't connect to that frequently, because they're in different organizations, they're in different places, and they see stuff that you don't see. And so the idea is to figure out how to connect to those. What I tell my students, and this is the simplest way to get started, think of two or three, four people that you used to know and you've lost touch with, who are interesting people, who might have a useful input on what you're doing now or a question you've got, reach out to them. Was thinking of you, I'm working on this problem. What do you think? You want to catch a 15-minute coffee or talk on Zoom? What do you think? These are called your dormant ties. And there's research that shows that what you get by doing this, reactivating these old connections, ends up being more useful and more novel than what you get from talking to the usual suspects. Hmm. You Number four in this is, you, you, which I, th- I found really interesting, be more playful with your sense of self. Give yourself permission to deviate from who you've always been for the sake of learning. Share more about this. A super, super fascinating part of your book. Sure. So I noticed really now more than 10 years ago, that authentic leadership became this hot topic. And everything was about being authentic. And then I started to notice that the way people define being authentic essentially amounted to being as I always have been, or having no filter saying what comes across my mind. And that's not what it is. And I especially noticed because I have always studied people going through big transitions in their work, that when you're making some of these big transitions, the getting out of your comfort zone that's required oftentimes pushed people's authenticity buttons. The first study I did, I was looking at consultants, lawyers, investment bankers, as they moved from the technical work to having to be client advisors. And that was really intimidating because the clients didn't want to know just the numbers. They wanted their perspective. They wanted kind of a big picture conversation and they felt a bit like they were imposters. And so it made them to actually step up and work on how do I communicate the big picture and how do I look the part of somebody who has gravitas and experience made them feel inauthentic. And I just thought this is interesting because a lot of times when you're in learning mode, what's going to happen is you're going to feel inauthentic and you can either recognize it as learning mode and say, okay, let me play with it. I'm not committing to be that person, but I'm going to try something different and see if it works out. Or I can say, oh, not me. And when you say, oh, not me, I don't, it's not authentic, then you've got the perfect protection. <laughs> so, it's not me. Who's going to say, don't be yourself? And, and paradoxically, often when we're feeling the most kind of cautious, insecure, not when you don't know, the tendency is to be as conservative as you can. And that's not really authentic either. That just means that you're kind of feeling cautious because you're a bit scared. So I found it really interesting. And the more I looked into it, the more I saw that a lot of these stepping up situations have attributes that make people feel inauthentic and how they dealt with it made such a difference to their ability to learn. One of the only constants, and this is a big part of your work, is change. We got to be adaptable. We have to understand that that's the only thing that will stay the same is that it's going to change. Let's get to real life with companies that we probably both talk to and work with. One of the things that some of them are going through that weren't previously had any remote elements are now they're either hybrid or they're all remote or a little bit of both, right? Where they're not coming to office. And so now leaders and managers are having to manage and build culture and do all the things that you need to do to build a great company, but do it through Zoom or Teams and getting together every once in a while, but not like it was before where they got together every day. What are some ways to build great culture when you're leading via Zoom like we're talking right now? Yeah. (laughs) You're not going to do it on Zoom. You're going to, the way you build great culture 
is you you respond to things to critical incidents, the opportunities that come up, threats that come up, violations, people behaving in ways that they shouldn't, even in a Zoom meeting, and you react. And it's by behavior that you are building a culture that says, this is what matters, this is what we do, this is what we don't do. You're not building it by having a little pre-Zoom socializing, a little post-Zoom socializing. That can be fine. But ultimately, the way culture gets built, if you think about how founders build cultures, they build those cultures because they've had things that have happened that were formative in the life of the organization. And then they've told stories about it. This happened We were the underdog, but we stuck to it and we succeeded. And this is what we did that worked. And so you reinforce that. And you have to find ways to continue to reward what matters and to call out what you don't, (laughs) the behaviors that you don't want, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in real life. But you also have to be able to tell the stories about what's making a difference, about how we got these customers, about how we scaled to this level. All of those things is part of it. And you can do that on Zoom or you can do that in in person. What do you think about, let's say you are remote. And I've studied uh, Matt Mullenweg's company, Automatic, and Nathan Berry's ConvertKit. And there's tons of others, bigger, smaller. And and a lot of the bigger ones are much more hybrid now, where there may be some element of in the office and some element not. What about those companies scheduling regular offsites or regular times to get together. Maybe they've saved some real estate costs and they can shift that budget to these offsite, whether it's leadership retreats with the leaders or even with the whole company. What are ways to- Like the Airbnb model. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. What are ways to do that? And maybe even some ideas of how to run those offsites in order to, again, to continue build the culture, even though it's different than it used to be. The truth is, I don't know, but there is a, a very healthy industry in offsite facilitation. This comes back down to what are you trying to accomplish? What is the key message that you want yeah. to convey? What are the key messages that you want to convey as a leader? How much of it is about key messages versus how much of it is, is it that you just want people socializing as people? Or what's the yeah. combination of those things? Where are we now? And what needs tweaking? So th- there's not there's not a, a formula for this. Most offsites include some mix of play and work. And I just, I don't think it is fundamentally any different. I think the thing that's hard with hybrid is how do you mix up those who are physically together and those who are not? Mm -hmm. And it also puts a much higher premium on the management skills of people leading these teams, because since you don't have the person in front of you, you can't throw a thing at them right then and there. So you you need to plan a bit more. Uh, You need to give more feedback. You need to have more review. All of those things that, as we talked about earlier, people haven't necessarily learned. They become more important because you have people in different places. And because you don't have that kind of right then and there for long periods of time that then allow time to be wasted as a result of leaders not being very good at delegating or at planning the work. Yeah. I think hiring is such an important part from a leadership perspective. Herminia, so if you were tasked, and maybe you do this, tasked to help a senior leader as he or she was building out their team. And part of the process was they're their making hiring decisions, whether to promote people up to leadership roles or hire from outside. I know there are some stats on that are troubling, but I'm really focused now more on the qualities, on what you're looking for. So if you're in that interview room, what are some of the must-haves? Like, What are the qualities you really want to see in a person if you're hiring them for a leadership role within a company? It depends on the company and depends on the leadership role. Some leadership roles, you want people to go full speed ahead. But it's one thing if you've got Elon Musk hiring somebody versus, I don't know, Satya Nadella hiring somebody. 
how establishes the organization, how establishes the market. How, what would how Satya how Nadella, can... since you have a lot of experience there, what do you think he would be looking for? Yeah, he was looking for people who who live the values that he was trying to get other people to live, people who were willing to try things, even though they couldn't know ahead of time what the outcome was going to be, people who were willing to say, I made a mistake here, and people who had respect for others around them. That's what he was looking for. I think when he was in the interview process, you wrote that he told them if you hire me, it's going to be different. It's going to be different than all these other candidates. It's going to be different than it was before. That took some guts. How, how was he able to do that? How was he able to show up with such guts to say, no, it's going to be different than everybody else. I'm not like I'm not like them. That that seems like it takes a lot of moxie, a lot of poise, a lot of confidence. What did you gather from that? Yes, it does. But at the same time, nobody is looking to hire a cookie cutter version of the previous leader, particularly when the organization has been underperforming for 10 years. Yeah. And so in many ways, it would have been tough for him to sell, I'm, you know, I'm the same as the rest of you. I think they were they were looking for somebody different. He came out of the cloud division. He had always worked more on the peripheral things at Microsoft as opposed to at the core in Windows. He was an engineer. And they wanted to get back to their engineering roots because they felt that they had gone too far in the sales and marketing direction. So he he was well aware of how well who he was and his difference kind of fit the needs of the organization at that point in time. It's not to say it didn't take guts to say, I'm going to be different. I'm not going to drive things the way they were driven before. But I think he also had a very good understanding that his brand of difference was what was needed for the organization at that time. I read, so I read that you get a lot of experience teaching senior executive programs at London Business School. And it's not something I've ever witnessed or seen. I've, I've wondered a lot though, when I, I know of executives who've gone away to one of those, whether it's a semester or it's a week or a few days, what are some of the topics, the, the focus areas when you're teaching these senior level execs that they've already been in it, they've lived it, right? They've done a lot of stuff, they've battled, and then they leave for a little bit or for a while to come be taught by you and others within the classroom uh, on how to be better. What are What's part of the curriculum or some of the interesting parts of the curriculum for a senior executive program? So I teach them a lot on leading change, using case studies like the Satya Nadella case, but also using case studies where you're not the CEO. For example, I have one with someone who was a direct report to Satya Nadella, who had to transform his organization, the sales organization. So how do you work with a mandate that's coming from the top? That is kind of giving some sense of marching orders, but you've got to appropriate it and you've got to make it yours in your unit. And how do you do that? And, and what they're really confronted with is everybody knows typically that's the needed direction. Every single organization is trying to be more, more nimble, more innovative, more customer focused. They all want the same thing. And what they're faced with is a lot of goodwill. A lot of people who understand they need to move in that direction, a lot of talent, but they've got archaeological piles and piles of old ways of doing things, legacy systems in the organization, whether these are IT systems that don't communicate with each other, uh, financial systems, HR systems, performance appraisal. We had a very good laugh with with the, the Microsoft story because um, we always have a good laugh with that because... They took them a couple of years to realize that the way they ran quarterly business reviews, like everybody does, was really defeating the purpose because the way they ran quarterly business reviews, they called it corporate theater. This, this is a, they had become corporate theater. This is kind of like the holy mass. You come, you stand up, you've got a deck of a hundred slides. There's no question you can't answer. It's all about putting on the show, being the smartest person in the room. People take notice and you'll get a big promotion. And it was so inconsistent with the two principles of what they were trying to do. One is admit mistakes, and we have conversations that help us do better in the future. That wasn't happening. And second of all, preparing for those things, since she had to be so perfect and had so much information, was taking months 
of people's time, months that they could have spent selling stuff actually to their customers and getting to know them. And so they really had to overhaul how they did that. And that's what my executives are facing is they have they're in organizations that are not fit for purpose, that have systems that don't work anymore. And it's not necessarily their remit to change how they do quarterly business review or change how they do performance appraisal, but they know these things don't work. And that's what they're grappling with is how do we make it really happen? Because you get some momentum, but fundamental change requires alignment of all of these things. That's what they need to do. So the style is case study. So uh, you, you give them the case study, they read through it, and it's more conversational. I'm fascinated by how people learn. I think it's really Let cool. me just, be, spe- yeah, let me just yeah. be specific here. So I teach them a couple of classes and they have tons of other colleagues who teach them a couple of classes. It's not me spending a whole swath of time with them. They're going to have colleagues from finance and marketing, and some of them are going to lecture, and some of them are going to put them through simulations, and some of them are going to have experiential exercises, and some are going to discuss case studies. And the idea is that these things built, and we look at the common threads throughout. But uh, the the, the main principle is the more active the learning, the better. Mm -hmm. But sometimes a, a good lecture can be very helpful too. We just don't spend our whole time lecturing. <laughs> gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And you you were at Harvard Business School and then left to go to London Business School. What made you want to make that change? I started my career at Harvard Business School. I was there 13 years. And I went to INSEAD Business School after INSEAD Business School in France, which alongside London Business School is one of the top schools outside the United States, one of the top business schools. And I went there because I needed a change. I wanted to live in Europe. I wanted to do some different things. And I had colleagues there. And I thought, actually, it was sort of my own, I applied my own principles. I needed a change. When you're an academic, you're lucky because you can have a sabbatical without burning your bridges. I said, I need a sabbatical. I'm going to go spend a year over there. And I really enjoyed it. I extended it a bit. They made me an offer and I stayed. Wow. How do you like it now being over there? So I I, I was there for 15 years and now I'm at the London Business School and I right. moved here really for personal reasons. My son went to school here and it was a family move. Very cool. Very cool. I'm curious when you talked, I would imagine people come to you for advice all the time, Herminia. And let's say somebody's maybe a bit earlier in their career and they say, I I don't know necessarily what I want to do, but I do want to make a positive impact in the world, be a positive contributor to others. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you give to that person? Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of people do ask. The first thing I say is whatever your first job or your first internship is, it's not all determining. We're not in that kind of world anymore. So you do not have to wait until this kind of perfect fit thing comes your way. Otherwise, you're doomed forever. Follow your nose and look at what interests you and try that out. And if it doesn't work, quit and go on to the next thing. And I mean, I'm sure you've seen the quit rates in the United States and how often people make job changes. We make 12 in, in now on average over a lifetime, but most of them we make young. We kind of, because we don't have the big mortgage or the big obligations. And so people try this, doesn't work. They try that. Maybe they go back to school, they try this and they're able to do it and there's no stigma to it. And that's what I would say is dabble a bit, try some things, but whatever you do, don't say I've got to get on the partner track right now, (laughs) even though it's not appealing to me because there's so many, there's so many other options. Such good advice. Follow your nose. What does that mean? Follow your nose is when you start talking to somebody, you get excited to learn what they're doing. You find that interesting. And you know when you don't, but you think it'll look good on your CV. So go chart a path towards what you're curious about. The chances of you becoming good at it dramatically go up. Imagine if you're curious about it, as opposed to just trying to get a paycheck. 
be. I mean, we can be very good for years at, at doing something that gives us a good paycheck. That's the good student profile. It doesn't mean you're going to be happy. And sometimes that's fine too. You do that until you're not happy anymore. I mean, that's how, that's how, by the way, my book, Working Identity, originated. I'd been following some professionals, high powered careers, as they were moving up and building their careers. And at some point, they were all bailing out. They were all moving on to something else, looking at startups, looking at nonprofits doing all kinds of things. The ones that were still there were trying to figure out or trying to plot their exit. And it's because they had changed, the world had changed, other opportunities were there. And so you, you've got to listen to yourself. We all have parts of our jobs that we don't love. But when the parts that you don't love are most of the parts and you're spending most of your time and it's kind of a drag, it's really important to to start looking around. Yeah, for sure. I'm very grateful for you and your work. I told you before we recorded it, we learn who we are in practice, not in theory. That quote, which David Epstein said on this podcast, and I've since said a thousand times, is so true and so accurate. I know this from like the sporting world of when I went from being a backup to being the starter that, yes, you can learn from watching and practicing but it's a whole different story when you're the one actually out under the field, under the bright lights with the other op- the, the opponent trying to beat you. That's when you really learn. We really learn who we are in practice, not in theory, when we're out doing it. And I think that alone um, is so useful and helpful for people to think about how they implement d- that daily into their lives of being somebody about doing it, about being in practice, and then iterating and reflecting and thinking and then do it again and again and again. It seems like you're a living example of of how all that works. I think it's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. This You've got the message. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I appreciate it. Two updated editions, Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader, Working Identity as well, Unconventional Strategies for Reinventing Your Career. Where else, Herminia, would you send my viewers, listeners to learn more about you online? My website, HerminiaIbarra.com. Perfect. Hermenia well, thank Ibarra. you again Twitter. for being Oh, Twitter? X. Oh. <laughs> yes. X and LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on both in my website. Perfect. Gotcha. Well, thanks again for doing this. I would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress. Very happy to. Thanks so much, Ryan. All right. Thank you so much. Bye.